Hey everybody, welcome to the Magic Weekly News Update for May 20th, 2018 on the Manalik. I'm John as always, and boy, there was news. It was spring announcement day on Friday, and it was a little bit less stuff than we usually get, but of course it caused an uproar in the online community. But let's put that aside for a quick second for the first piece of news this week. Spellslingers is coming back on May 30th. For those who missed it the first time around, Spellslingers is a magic series on the YouTube channel Geek and Sundry, hosted by famous StarCraft commentator Day9. Be warned, super serious magic players, this is not directed at you, but you can still have fun watching it, as I do. It involves Day9 and a famous, or famous-ish, or not famous person, either from within the magic community or from elsewhere, playing a friendly game of magic. There's a lot of banter back and forth, talking head segments mid-game about plays and big swings and advantage, and it's all in all just fun. I definitely recommend going back and checking out the first season. It's really just what magic is about. Two people having fun with a great game. It's not the most serious pro tour competition, but it doesn't have to be. Now back to the announcement day stuff. Up first... Some controversy, I'll say those words a few times. The two Planeswalkers from the Global Series decks were revealed as Jiang Yanggu, a young Planeswalker with a puppy, that's about all you need to know, and Mu Yanling, a blue mage that does blue mage things. These two Planeswalkers front two decks that are heavily influenced by Chinese mythology, and they come out June 22nd. But here's the really strange thing. The cards in these decks are standard legal. Presumably, if they're just like every other Planeswalker deck, there will be the, the Planeswalkers that we see. There will be one rare, two uncommons, and three commons that are unique to the decks. They will be standard legal. But only in China. This is the first th time anything like this has happened, and it's caused an uproar. Now, of course, a lot of that uproar is all completely hypothetical. This is ruining the game because now Wizards has to decide whether Taiwan is part of China or not and will cause an international instant. Cries people who strangely are suddenly deeply interested in global politics this week. After having never been before, how will people who play in China and also play globally deal with having two different standard decks, etc.? Are, are, are all these hypothetical complaints that don't really affect that many people or anybody at all. Now, don't get me wrong. This is an extremely strange policy and one that I would prefer to not see happen again. It is very strange to have two different standard environments, to have two different legalities based on location. That's weird. And it could cause some unnecessary headaches, but... Look at those Planeswalkers. They're not really what I'd call playable. We've seen Planeswalkers decks for, for a couple of years now, and I think once there was a playable card, and that was Flame Slash, and it was Fringe playable. And if you really, really, really desperately wanted it, it was really easy to get it. Um, so I, I, I don't think there's going to be any problem here. You're not missing out on these cards because they're almost guaranteed to be unplayable in Standard. And you are probably not a, ch a player in China who is also traveling globally. You, you are probably not actually interested in the global politics of the One China policy and whether Wizards is going to cause World War III. Ultimately, this is just going to cause a negative impact to basically zero people. I'll reiterate, I don't want to see this become a common thing in the future. But I also could not care less about this instance of it, and I, I don't really think anybody listening probably has any real reason to actively care about this instance of it. You can agree that it shouldn't happen again, but relax on the, oh my god, this is the worst thing ever because I'm deeply interested in global politics, because... <laughs> I see through that facade. Anyways, next controversy. Buy a box promos are back for Core Set 19. With the release of Dominaria, we got a buy a box promo that was unique. Literally, it couldn't be found in any booster packs. You could only get it by buying a box. People lost their minds over it, and the feedback online on Reddit, giant bold letters there, was universally negative. Now, surprise, 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 exactly as I predicted... The card has not made any waves in any format, and it can be delivered straight to your door right now. Pro uh, you know, tomorrow, shipping takes time. 
for like seven bucks. But why does it cost seven bucks if it's not playable? I hear people complain, and my response is, why do you care? If it's not playable and you don't want it, does it matter that it costs seven bucks? It could cost a thousand bucks. It could cost 50 cents. You're not playing it. Why do you care? Of course, the biggest argument is, what about when Wizards makes a mistake and prints a card that is a four of in a format? Yes, that would suck. The card's going to be insanely priced. It's going to be like 50, 60, 70 bucks, and you're going to need four of them. But they haven't done that yet. In fact, one of the most common complaints that I hear from people is that Wizards refuses to make good promos. So how is Wizards on the cusp of about to make the strongest promo and most expensive promo ever? Uh, I don't buy it. Treating every single thing that Wizards does as a mistake waiting to happen is frankly an awful mindset. If that's how you feel decisions, then you probably should just stop following Wizards' decisions or Wizards needs to just shut down as a company. Hell, this video that I'm making right now, or the next one, or the next one, or the next one, could be the video that destroys my channel. I better just stop making content, right, before that happens. I refuse to condemn wizards for a future potential mistake, especially when there's that common, 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 common complaint that wizards refuses to make good promos. You can't have it both ways. Wizards cannot continuously make awful promos and also be just about to make the promo that breaks the economy. So I don't have a huge problem with these bio box promos. My instinct, especially after seeing fire song and Sunspeaker, is that these promos are going to be heavily targeted towards commander players, people who do not buy boxes of product because they have like two or three singles they want to buy from each set. I'm going to predict it continues on that route. But one of the big stories that came out from the controversy of this happening is based on Mark Rosewater having said that he passed the negative feedback on to the powers that be, and yet they still did it. What a liar, right? Well, no, he said he passed on the feedback. At your job, you can pass on a customer complaint to your boss, but your boss doesn't just immediately change company policy because of it, right? What came out from this was a reminder that Reddit is not Magic the Gathering. Reddit is a tiny drop in the global Magic community. You need to remember that the vast majority of Magic players don't even play at stores. They don't even play in sanctioned tournaments. Reddit is a tiny drop and one hell of an echo chamber. Stores loved the promotion. Sales went through the roof. Was it entirely because of the promo? Absolutely not. Dominaria was a huge part of it. But... You know what'll give them more data on how much of an effect the buy a box promo has? Doing it again. Especially with a core set, a product that tends to sell relatively poorly. Anyways, this is just yet another example of a hypothetical problem the online community has dreamt up of a future huge problem that'll happen with a current policy that has zero impact on them right now. Relax, moderate yourself, speak up on things you disagree with, but do so reasonably and understand that your viewpoint, opinion, etc. may not actually be the majority or, or in the best interest of others. Anyways, on to the next controversy. Well, ac actually, no, this one's not really controversial at all. We got a couple spoilers from Battle Bond and they look really cool and fun. It's not a product that I'm going to cover much because I don't think it's really going to fire at our local game store. It's not online and it comes out so close to the next real set and I've got to get set reviews ready and etc. And I made the stupid mistake of uh, planning a vacation right in the middle of set review time. So I don't know how it's going to work just yet. But anyways, we got to see Pierre and his imaginary friend, Toothy. They reveal a new-ish mechanic for Battle Bond, which is partner with. Just like partner that we've seen before, you can have two commanders if they both have partner, but partner with introduces a twist. Peer partners with Toothy, and vice versa. And that means that when one ETBs, target player can go search up the other from their library and put it into their hand. Pretty nifty, and since it is worded as target player, you, you can actually play Peer while your two-headed giant partner can play a deck that has Toothy, so you don't have to be green-blue, and they can go get Toothy when you play Peer, or vice versa. Now, being that they're rares, I, I'd expect this effect uh, to not really come together that often in draft, which is kind of a pain, uh, but still kind of a cool little thing. I do hope to get a video uh, about this set at some point, like a vlog or something perhaps, but I wouldn't expect much more content than that. 
Now, for real, on to the next controversy. We know about the next three sets after Corset 2019, and they are all Ravnica all the time. In the fall, we get Guilds of Ravnica, a set focused on Selesnya, Boros, Golgari, Izzet, and Demir. Early next year, we get Ravnica Allegiance, a set focused on the other five guilds, Azorius, Rakdos, Gruul, Simic, and Orzov. Then finally in the spring, we get an unnamed set that will focus on the culmination of the current storyline and not on the guilds. So while it will be Ravnica in setting, I'd expect it to feel pretty unRavnica like I'm not expecting uh, a heavy gold theme at all there. So what's the controversy here? Well, they just announced that they weren't doing blocks anymore. And now here's a block. Except no, this is not a block. This is three sets on the same plane, which they explicitly stated was something that they would do in that article where they announced the move to single sets. They said, if the story demands it, we might stick around on a plane for two or three sets. So immediately stop that complaint right there. They, they told you this was coming. These sets are going to be mechanically separate. They're not going to be drafted together. That sure doesn't sound like a block to me, now does it? Remember, it was very recent that spending three sets on a single plane was the absolute norm, and hell, we just got our 30th visit to Dominaria. So three sets on Ravnica? Not a big deal. I have my slight concerns. The downside of Ravnica was always that the draft formats had five decks that eight people had to split somehow, and that's just not good. Though RTR kind of made it work. RTR is actually in my top 10 draft formats, but of course, Gatecrash is in my bottom five for sure, so it can go either way. Hopefully, they've learned their lessons and maybe found a way to make a few more decks work outside of those five. Anyways, I'm excited. Magic's fun. I enjoy the storyline, and I'm excited to see how it ends. And if you hate the storyline, cool. It's less than a year before it ends, so be happy for once. Maybe give it a try. It's, it's kind of fun. Well, anyways, that was a lot, but we still have story time to go. Story time this time around will go quick, though. Episode 10 of Return to Dominaria is one I would definitely recommend going and reading because it was a lot of really good, funny, cute stuff about Slimefoot's existence that really does condense down to not much content. Uh, but it was a fun read. Anyways, we start out with Slimefoot's first thoughts, having grown from a spore from the seed used to regrow the weatherlight structure. Slimefoot's spot on the ship is about to be trimmed off by Arvad and Tiana, and so it detaches itself as a sapperling and makes the arduous climb away, eventually setting in the engine near a warm white star, the Power Stone. Slimefoot grows as the ship eventually is rebuilt and begins its trip to pick up various crew members. Slimefoot hears the voices of the crew as it grows, and the Power Stone actually tells Slimefoot about them as well, as it has a connection to the living aspect of the Weatherlight, having been grown from the same seed. Slimefoot hears various snippets of the return of Teferi, Karn, Chandra rejoining Gideon and Liliana, and the current plans to attack the Cabal. During this time, he also reproduces, creating several small sapperling offspring. Eventually, Tiana and Arvad discover it in the engine room and, and are greeted with friendly waves from Slimefoot and its several arms. The crew isn't quite sure what to do with Slimefoot, but they also don't really view it as any sort of threat. It wanders around the ship, meeting the crew members that it's heard so much about during its growth. It helps Joyra with some artificing. It hears Liliana attempt, unsuccessfully, to understand how Arvad doesn't eat people and how he manages to not be selfish, and eventually it sits down with Karn and hears about its, his plan to destroy the Phyrexians. The Power Stone reacts to the mention of Phyrexia with some sort of emotion, but Slimefoot isn't sure whether it's anger, fear, or anticipation. Moving from Slimefoot, we get to see a bit of Chandra's practice with Jaya. Jaya tells Chandra that she doesn't know what she wants. She thinks she knows what she wants, but she doesn't actually know what she wants. Chandra tells Jaya about Nyssa and how leaving her felt like she was abandoning her, but that's why she was so angry and wouldn't listen to Jaya at first. But she now knows what she wants, and that is to burn Belzenlock and the Cabal off this plane. Jaya replies simply with, uh, huh, and tells her that she's going to get her chance to prove this as the ship approaches Urborg, home of the Cabal. So that's it for the news this week. There was a lot of news and a lot of controversy that I had to shut down or attempt to shut down. As always, have fun for once. Relax. Magic's not dying. Magic's not going away because of any of this stuff that came out this week. If you don't like it, be responsible. Be reasonable. Don't 
lose your minds over it. Anyways, if you uh, like the content, as always, click that thumbs up button. Click subscribe if you want to see more. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter at The Manaleek. That's L-E-E-K, like the vegetable, not the card. You can find me at Facebook.com slash The Twitch.tv slash The Manaleek, and Patreon.com slash The Manaleek. If you got those questions, comments, or suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, see you all next time.